Hey everyone, this is our first pre-recorded zoology lecture class and uh, I am Tracy Finn and I'm now going to discuss about the history and the evidences of evolution. And um, I think this is the most important field of biology and the zoology because it is connecting all the central points of what we call as the, the mother of all um, branches of biology, which is the evolution. So we will learn more about that in a few more slides. So according to Charles Darwin, um, organic evolution is what we call as the decent rate of modification. Decent modification means that uh, populations are changing over time. And if the populations are changing, um, these species will occupy a certain area, okay? A certain area where they are inhabiting, they are exchanging their unique set of genes. And um, he also said evolution does not imply any particular lineage or any particular mechanism because virtually all scientists will agree that the evidence for change in organisms over long periods of time is overwhelming. And um, as, as you go by the, rap the, the rapid changes that happens in one population, will greatly affect the, the, the organisms that are inhabiting on the other population as well. Because make competition, you recall that uh, prey and predator relationship and all sorts of um, relationships in the food chain is affected greatly when there is a, a change or a unique set of genes that is, that is being introduced to one place. Further, most scientists agree that natural selection is um, for evolution. Um, Charles Darwin outlined, which is, um, he said that how evolution occurs is through natural selection. The natural selection is um, choosing the best fit I and mean, then choosing the, the best organism that can be, um, that can transfer its genetic material from one generation to the next generation. And in spite of this contra um, scientific certainty of the evolution and an acceptance of the general mechanism, much is still to be learned about the details of the evolutionary process because it is still um, a developing a developing branch of science. And um, as much as we're concerned, we are um, collecting the remnants of the of the previous or the past for us to understand and for us to um, debate if if really humans are are genetically linked to apes and lower forms of primates. So um, they are debating for years because this is not just a a, a simple science, it's, it's a very complicated study. So this is an example of a, um, an organism which he found in Galapagos Islands. Galapagos Islands is um, an important area of research by Charles Darwin when he um, started his voyage during um, the discovery of that island. So that island is, is being said as to be a virgin island because um, the organisms there are peculiar and uh, unique in their own ways. So the, it's like it's, it's uh, made up of different islets and islands and Galapagos Islands are, are found in part of the South America. So here um, this is a iguana, land iguana, we call it Codolophus cristanus. So we have pre Darwinian theories of change. Before Darwin, there's a lot of uh, scientists that are debating about this um, evolution thing. Um, pre Darwinian theories will describe you a, an evolutionary change which is um, emerging prior to Charles Darwin. So we have this. Um, evolutionary change which is started with the ancient Greeks. Alright, so the history will tell you that um, the philosophers Empedocles and Aristotle are describing concepts of change of the living organism through time. And uh, George Louis Buffon, which spent many years studying comparative anatomy. So uh, it is not a new field, it is uh, an emerging field wherein people from the past, before Darwin, had already stated that Living organisms has has, um, has under has underwent changes. Okay. Mm 
Maxie Erasmus Darwin, which is the grandfather of Charles Darwin, which is intensely uh, interested in questions of origin and change. Uh, he believed in the common ancestry of all organisms. So, um, Erasmus Darwin, the a physician, which is uh, who is um, believing that there is a common ancestry for all for all organisms. There is a single ancestor that is the start okay, of all organisms that lies on Earth. Jean Baptiste Lamarck or John Baptiste Lamarck was a distinguished French zoologist. So his contributions to zoology, including important studies of animal classification, and he once studied giraffe. Okay, um, his important um, books are also in, um, widely used by taxonomists. Okay, and the theory of inheritance was also um, being accepted before. So he studied um, giraffe and uh, modif um, modifying existing organs. Why giraffe had a very long neck and uh, why giraffe had um, improved, okay? Um, gra gathering and hunting for f um, leaves when, when there are scarcity of um, trees on your level, okay? Charles Darwin also accepted the idea of inheritance, the same thing. He believed, um, Lamarck believed that the disuse resulted in the degeneration of organs. If you are not using the organs in your body, say for example, um, a deep sea fish has not been using his eyes in, in the deep ocean because light could not pass through the, the, the bottom of that ocean. The eyes were, were, um, were not lost, but it, it is, um, Losing its function, they cannot be really seen the dark. That's why they don't need the eyes. Instead of that, uh, they're using some of the material, uh, some of the organs in their body, like their their senses, their the chemoreceptors, their skin, their the sense of smell, etc. So these kind of um, degeneration of organs, or the disuse of the de degeneration of organs, has um, made Lamarck popular during that time. For the more clear knowledge, um, he accepted um, that a theory of inheritance that we now know is not correct led him to erroneous conclusions about how evolution occurs. Because that, that's not always happens in nature. And there is no evidence okay, that changes in the environment can initiate changes in the organisms and that can be passed to future generations. Because the environment itself is it's really not reliable for, for an organism to change. Maybe maybe the, the giraffes have uh, um, started the the hunting of, uh, gathering of leaves in the long um, in the tall trees, but it doesn't mean directly imply that because of the tall trees, the giraffe's neck had elongated. So instead, change originated in the processes of a gamete formation, and you've learned that one in the previous module that gamete formation. Is an important um, thing in what we call the sexual re uh, genetic recombination from the alleles or the traits coming from your parents that makes us um, diverse. So, for a concept check, um, it's a question. Um, extinction is one of the possible outcome of evolutionary change. If Lamarck had been correct regarding the mechanism of evolutionary change. Would extinction be more a likely or less likely outcome of evolutionary change? So, please kind of, uh, kindly, I'll drop a discussion board in this uh, after this lecture that kindly answers this question. So, for the voyage of the HMS Beagle, um, this is Darwin and he, the the start of his expedition. The, the the same thing with other Europeans across the world when they try to find a new world. Okay, um, Charles Darwin grew up and was educated in England, and he was coming from a prominent family. Um, he served as a naturalist for a five-year mapping expedition. And one of the Darwin's observations, especially in the Galapagos Islands, was the, the basis for his theory of evolution. So, um, this is the 
Insight shows the two of the islands as photographed in the space shuttle Atlantis, and he used many boat, many ships to voyage the the Galapagos Islands and the rest of the world. Okay, so for the voyage of the um, HMS Beagle, um, these are the routes. Okay, where he discovered the Galapagos Islands, which is like located on the South uh, South America. Okay. So the blue lines will tell you his early voyage from England. So starting from England, he went to Cape Verde Islands, going to South America, and going to the tip of South America, where we could get, um, reaching Galapagos Islands, okay, and went went back to the other across um, the islands in in Oceania, okay. Then the red lines will return the voyage to England, going from Australia, going back to some islands in Madagascar and the Indian Ocean, going back to um, South America, Cape Verde Islands, and going back to England. So this is um, the journey of the HMS Beagle, the ship which was um, being used by Darwin during his expedition. Um, a giant slot, okay. In this image, Charles Darwin found the evidence of the existence of giant slots in South America, similar to this um, megatherium, okay. So they, these giant slots have lived 10,000 years ago, that's a long time ago, and weighed in excess of um, almost a thousand kilograms. So these uh, species did, um, did not move through tree branches like their only living relatives. Okay, Colepus, which is a 4.5 kilogram. Instead, they probably fed on leaves and lower tree branches that they could reach from the ground. So they are relying on the on the stuff or the diet that is available on the ground. Then the similarity of giant slots and the modern day slots impressed Darwin with the fact that species change over time. And um, these many species have become extinct. Okay, it was being lost in captivity. It is not found in any part of the world when we call extinct. As in this case, they often leave descendants that provide evolutionary change. So the descendants are descendants of these giant slots are the ones which we are using now to trace back their their ancestors. The evolutionary origins of these giant slots. Okay? In South America. We have this Galapagos, Galapagos tortoise, okay, um, we have letter A and letter B, a shorter neck subspecies of this Felonides nigra, which live in the moister regions and feed in low growing vegetation. So look at the neck, okay. Letter B is a longer neck subspecies which lives in drier regions and feed on high growing vegetation. So um, the tortoise known as the lonesome George was the last of the G. nigra abingdoni species, and he died in 2012. So this is um, a very sad story for these tortoises because um, the, the, these are living in small populations, okay? But since we have not yet tracked them and um, lost our eyes on them, they are lost, they are now extinct. So also these are these impress Darwin during his expedition. So the theory of evolution by natural selection by Charles Darwin has four requirements, okay, for evolution to occur. Um, it it must be met for for um, the natural selection to occur, and will explain how our productive success in a type of environment are related to evolutionary adaptation. So we have this, uh, we have to explain this one by the end of this lesson. Reproductive success, okay? What is, reprodu what is reproductive success? How can we say that uh, they have successfully transferred the gametes from, from generations to generations? Also with the phenotype, how are they um, di differentiated from one another? One another phenotype is the, the, the physical makeup, okay? or the outward makeup of an organism and how evolutionary changes are being led by environments. So Thomas Malthus uh, wrote an essay for the 
principle of population and the ideas of how this change appeared to develop on his voyage. So the principle of population believe um, Marcus Malthus believed that the young population has the potential to increase geometrically. Okay? But however, since um, the resources can keep pace with the increased demands of a burgeoning population, population and restraining factors such as the poverty, wars, plagues, and gaming began to have an influence. Um, just like we're having right now. So um, this pandemic has um, decreased uh, the, the number of elder generation or elder population across the world because most of the severe cases of COVID, uh, critical and severe cases of COVID-19 has affected greatly the elderlies. So that is um, in accordance with Thomas uh, Malthus's essay on the principle of population. That the human population is increasing geometrically. So that's like that's just like exponentially, okay? But because of some demands, we are limiting this to happen. So natural selection are in the four requirements. First, we have our organisms have a far greater reproductive potential than is ever realized. Reproductive potentials. Um, the ability of an organism to pass on its gametes to its offspring and to the next generation. Inherited variations exist and they arise from a variety of sources, including mutation, genetic recombination, and random fertilization. These are um, inherited variations, which is important in the diversity of animals on Earth. They must be, um, these cells must be mutated, uh, passing by genetic recombination, and also random fertilization. So these important things, because resources are limited, existence is a constant struggle. Yeah, many more offspring are produced and resources can support, therefore many individuals die. And it's very evident in some of the animals in the animal kingdom. Because when they say fishes or amphibians, they, they release a lot of eggs, right? Um, thousands, hundreds, ten thousands, but only a few will survive because that is intended to, to balance okay, the ecosystem which we are they are fighting. And um, because limited uh, resources, we are gonna take a look at the uh, at the amount of resources that is intended for each animal. Adaptive traits become more common in subsequent generations because organisms with maladaptive traits are less likely to reproduce and these maladaptive traits become less frequent in a population. So adaptive traits are more common, okay? adaptive, adapt, adaptation. These have adapted from generations to generations. Um, those who have mal, which means abnormal adaptation of traits, could not thrive in a population. And they are frequently um, counted. So there's another thing about natural selection, and it's related because we um, are calling this an artificial selection, and it's evident right now when we have pets in the, in the house. So these dogs of Canis familiaris were domesticated between 30,000 to 20,000 years ago. It's, it, it's really, really an emerging field then because 99% of uh, genetically similar to Canis lupus, a gray wolf, they have been tested these dogs, okay, studying their mitochondrial DNA, um, compared it to the ancestral species, and so on. But their ancestral wolf species are still unknown, okay? Um, they um, you people in the Europe before are selecting dogs for for fun, like um, for Zed, some of the accessories. I, I want like this. I, I, I want this trait. I want a furry furry dog. I want the short and the tall neck dog, etc. So these um, dogs have primarily been bred for generations and enjoyment for the status of the riches. Okay, some of them are used for working. Uh, dogs that are working like the sheep and the sheep dog and um, the other bee dog is bred for herding sheep in England okay some of them are used for hunting some of them are helping the people to act uh, for pasteurizing okay the I mean pasture for pasteurizing the field herding 
Another C is an Ireland bred dog was used for hunting deers and wolves. So that's the, the reason why the uh, artificially selected these dogs because it can always be a, a best friend for, for these people. And now we are using them for luxury. So adaptation is an important word. We ad adapt because um, a heritable change in a phenotype increases the chances of an animal to successfully reproduce in a specified environment. So, which is very important in, in studying um, evolution because when adaptation is defined in a single specified environment, a change promotes a successful reproduction in one environment may be detrimental to the reproductive success of the other in the other in the on the other population in a different environment. So um, organisms, animals must have um, heritable change in phenotype. Okay, they must have a a phenotype which is can, which can cater um, different forms of. Um, of environmental changes, of, of um, sexual changes, I mean, um, partnerships, mating, etc. So these must be adapted. Like in this one, this example is here, an Arctic hare. Okay, try to look at its body. It's um, it has white fur. It has um, a re relatively large size, and um, we call it Arctic hare. And in, in its adaptations, we have Lupus arcticus because it lives in the Arctic, okay, in Canada and, uh, and Greenland on rocky slopes of the higher elevation tundra. So this hair is feeding on leaves, shoots, grasses, flowers, roots, and bark. Um, they show a variety of evolutionary adaptations for living in the Arctic, including the white fur. So most of the animals in the Arctic region have a lighter, or we say white fur. Because that's a useful adaptation to hide themselves from predators because snows from their surroundings will will mask them, okay? Will camouflage them against the predators, the, 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 these things. So um, in snowy white or winter snowy white winter coat and it has a small ears also to adapt in a excessive heat loss and large feet to allow them to show snowshoe across the winter landscape. So it must have a big feet, large feet. Because if it is a tiny feet then the, the feet will will be um, buried in, in snow. So adaptive radiation also is a um, resulting in the evolution of multiple new groups if the environment can be exploited in different ways. When the evolution of multiple groups occurs adaptation uh, adaptive radiation occurs. So, um, this is an adaptive radiation of the Galapagos finches. These are birds, okay, from the South American mainland colonizing the Galapagos Islands. Um, open habitats and few predators promoted the radiation of finches into 14 different species. So, from one, spe from one ancestral finch, okay, in the middle, look at this one, um, we have different diet, source of diet. We have plants, insects, tool use, okay, seeds, cactus, and insects. Um, they are um, coming into 14 different species because of this adaptive radiation. Because they are, I said, going back to this life, when the, um, there is a multiple new groups that evolved, okay, and the environment can be exploited in many different ways and there's a lot of a source of diet and food in that, in that environment then the evolution of the multiple groups will happen and we call it adaptive radiation so look, try to look at their beaks when they try to eat plants like this vegetarian tree finch they have this um, narrow beak when we try to see a insect type of finch Insect eating, they have this um, pointed beaks. When we have these um, seeds, they have a large ground, uh, large and um, I think it's heavy, more heavier um, and harder beak for the seeds to, to 
be crunched. So that's adaptive radiation. Also, Alfred Russell Wallace is um, believing that evolutionary modification was a product of selection and therefore has to be adapted for an organism. So at the same time with Darwin, on the other hand, I think that the natural selection may have explained all evolutionary changes because um, it is it is really an important thing if we try to um, insert the radiation, adaptive radiation to the emergence of species because that does always apply to all animals, okay? Especially for mammals, it's very different to grow different types of um, mouth because we, we are, most of us are omnivorous and carnivorous, okay? For mammals, some of, some of the mammals are herbivorous and we cannot really depict which is which. And Alfred Russell Wallace was um, an, a friend to Darwin and he said to him in 1864 that I shall always maintain the theory of evolution by natural selection to be actually yours and yours only. And you had worked it out in details and had never thought of years before I had a ray of light on the subject. There is a number here. Never mind. Microevolution, macroevolution, and evidence of macroevolutionary change. So, coming from the prefix itself, you already know what, what, what does it mean. Micro, small, macro, big and some evidence of macro-evolutionary change. We compare the two ideas, macro and micro-evolution, and describe the sources of evidence for macro-evolution. So micro-evolution is a, defined earlier as a change in populations over time, or simply with descent with modification. The change must involve in the genetic makeup of a population in order for it to be passed to future generations. So there must be a change in a population and pass it on the different uh, future generation for that to happen, for organic evolution to happen, okay? Well, these observations have led biologists to look for the mechanisms by which changes occur. There is no doubt that genetic changes and populations occur and they have been directly observed in the field and in the laboratory. So, um, it is always an important thing to consider that um, we study the, these animals in the laboratory for us to um, simulate that the, 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 stuff, the stuff that happens outside of nature. And uh, these changes are the reason that bacteria gain resistance to antibiotics. An agricultural pest will resistant to pesticides. So a change in the frequency of the alleles in population over time is called microevolution. Um, bacteria in your body, okay, uh, if they are in your body, they, they are called the good bacteria, and we have bad bacteria or the harmful bacteria, we call them pathogens. So uh, before we introduce the antibiotic, um, there's a lot of clinical trials, laboratory trials that has been um, formulated, okay, to, to treat and to fight off bacteria and um, because of the resistance of this bacteria in the future generations we also have to level up okay we have also we, have, we also have to increase the dosage or the the ability of the bacteria uh, but antibiotic to kill this bacteria so that's happening in microevolution Macroevolution over longer time scales. Okay, the, uh, microevolutionary processes result in large scale changes, whereas large scale changes result in extinction and the formation of new species are called macroevolution. Okay, that is um, for the longer period of time. How how extinction and um, new species have been formed. Is what we call as a macro revolution, and they are difficult to observe in progress because of the geological time scales they are usually involved. And um, as we are concerned, um, it's really hard to trace back the, the 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 past because there are fewer studies, okay, that linking um, 
the existence of these species, had they existed or not. So we are trying to know that more of that. Biog geography, biogeography. We are um, living in um, an island, an archipelago, consisting of many different islands in the Philippines. So, um, like, we have found um, languages, okay, and the origins of languages coming from the uplands, lowlands of uh, Luzon. Besides in Mindanao, we have a variety of um, ethno-linguistic groups, okay? Also in biogeography, it is the same with language and um, culture norms. Because in biogeography, we study the type of vegetation in this area, okay? the living populations of animals and plants in this area, etc. How are they being affected by, by human factors and so on. So this is a study of the geographic distribution of animals and plants. So biogeographers are trying to explain why organisms are distributed as they are. And at the same time, um, it shows that life forms in different parts of the world have distinctive evolutionary histories. Really inter interesting. Um, people from South America, Latin America, okay, also with um, Africa and Australia, yeah, that's it. and the rest of the continents are like a big jigsaw puzzle. So when they are um, separate, become separated during the the continental drift, and yeah, they are crashing through each other. So we have mountain um, uh, mountain ranges, etc. So yeah. It's really important to, to study the geographic distribution of these animals and evolutionary change as well. So for the this image, we have that part, the Panthera pardus. Oh, I, I remember Black Panther. Yeah, that, that, because Panther um, is the genus name of, of leopard and all big cats. Okay. In Africa and Asia, a similar ecological role that of the letter B, which is Jaguar, Panthera onca of Central and South America. The, the similar form suggests a common ancestry even though they are separated by apparently insurmountable oceanic barriers. So they, yeah, as I said earlier, it's a big jigsaw puzzle. And the same thing with Tarshir in the Philippines. So we have, the, we have known that Tarshirs are, are only found in Bohol Island. Okay, these primate, nocturnal primates, are, are not just found in Bohol, they are found in Mindanao, Samar, and Leyte. So when these um, land masses are united before, they were once living in the same land or same island. But when, when, when they are become separated, they, they are um, transferred from different places again. So, letter C is a spotted varieties of these species are distinguished by the presence of jaguar or absence of that part of small spots with thin dark present markings of their coats. Biogeographers have provided probable explanations for these observations. Okay? So, this blue one are the existence of jaguar and the green one are the existence of the leopard. So try to look at their print. Okay, how can you say that it's a panther or it's a leopard? It's very difficult to to distinguish the two. But again, they they uh, say their similar form suggests a common ancestry. Um, very small differences, but again, coming from the same genes, panthera. We have biogeographic regions of the world. And this is the map showing you a Palearctic region, Nearctic region, Neotropical region, Australian region, um, Sahara Desert, the Ethiopian region, and the Oriental region. So in the Philippines, we are a part of the Oriental region. That's why people call us the Orientals. Another piece, the Himalayan mountains. When, when the Pali Arctic region and the Oriental region has collided, it resulted into a long mountain range we call as the Himalayan mountain. 
Sciences. So we have paleontology. Paleontology is the study of fossils. Um, the fossil record, of course, and the most direct evidence of evolution. So for fossils, okay, we coming from the root root fossilis, um, we know that fossils from, from the remnants of plants and animals that are uh, incorporated or fused, merged, embedded, yeah, that's the right term, in uh, an earth's crust, like the rocks, okay, sedimentary rocks, for instance. Um, they uh, most commonly fossilization is occurring in sediments like silt sand or volcanic rocks, quickly covering organisms. Yeah, because uh, it's really important to know that the volcanic eruptions are um, natural natural way of of mother nature to to regenerate the entire ecosystem of the area. So um, they cover the organism to prevent scavenging in a way that it seals out oxygen and slows decomposition. It's like um, the volcanoes will will help paleontologists discover some of the remnants of these plants and animals when they are becoming extinct. Fossils such as these trilobites, okay, are direct evidence of evolutionary change. They look like a anything cockroach. Yeah, um, existed about 500 million years ago and became extinct about 250 million years ago. Fossil forms when the animal dies and is covered with sediments. Water dissolves the calcium from the part body parts and replaces it with another mineral, forming the rock heart replica of the mineral animal. This is a process called mineralization. Look at these. These are outstanding, these are amazing features found in the rocks. Now we'll learn about analogy and homology. Analogy and homology. Okay, for the evolution of the super Especially similar structures um, in unrelated organisms. Unrelated, like uh, what are the unrelated organisms? They know um, birds and insects. They fly, right? They, we call that convergent evolution. And the similar structures are said to be analogous. Okay, analogous, which means proportionate. When resemblance may also occur be between two organisms share a common ancestry, structures and Process in two kinds of organisms that are derived from a common ancestry are said to be homologous. Okay, homolog plus OS, which is a grain, or having the same similar relation. So also with comparative anatomy, look at this um, skeletons of primates. It's a study of the structure of living and fossilized animals and homologies that indicate evolutionary close relationships. Yeah, like the birds and the reptiles. Uh, birds are used to is a reptile by other name. It's what they call the birds. They are reptiles, but in the other name, they can fly. Then it's just fly too. So reconstruction of an evolutionary lineage from an evidence in the fossil record. Um, this fossil record allows the horse evolution to be traced back about 5,500 years ago. Okay. So try to look at these um, horse ancestors coming from 60 years ago, 60 million years before present, the Hyophirium, which is 20 kilograms, okay? Illustrations depict anatomical changes that occurred during the horse evolution. Um, the horses before are smaller compared to the modern day horses. Okay? Um, primarily browsing animals that walk in the tips of three to four toes, try to look at that one. The higher pophyrium, 10 kilograms, very um, lightweight. Um, and evolution has resulted in bigger animals, which is adapted to our grazing lives. So try to look at the animals in the grazing field. They're they're bigger, they're much heavier compared to the animals that are, that are Carnivorous chatter, except for the lion, I think so. So yeah, that's it. Note that the evolutionary changes um, are seldom simple letters of changes. Said numerous evolutionary side branches often meet with extinction. 
So these branches are um, like this or hippos, epihippos, haplohippos, melohippos. These are lost. These are because they, they become they became extinct to the time. So these key like primarily browser browser that they browse they they search for some available food. Grazer or browser they graze I mean they graze in browse. <laughs> primarily grazer, I mean they rely on their diet. Um using the, 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 the grazing technique searching for food. The concept of homology also will tell us that the four limbs of vertebrates evolved from an ancestral pattern. Okay? Even vertebrates as dissimilar as whales and bats have the same basic arrangement of bones. So you will learn that one in your lab um, the, the, the basic um, types of bones that are found in your four limbs. Okay? So they are numbered. Number one, we have, excuse me, thumb to number five, little finger. So color coding indicates homologous bones. Like this brown one, look at this, the gray, the red, and the white. So they come from single accessor because the pattern has almost the same. Um, same set of patterns. How about the evolution of the vertebrate ear ossicles? Okay. Natural view of the skull of a primitive amphibian shows the two bones, the quadrate and the articular, the smallest bone in the in the human body, also for the ear, ear bones, function in jaw support and contribute to the middle ear bones of mammals. So look at this one, letter A. Because amphibians, yeah, the early primitive animals on Earth, the quadrate and articular, they are jaw support lang before, okay? But now, the letter B is a primitive amphibian. Try to see this one. Inner ear, uh, middle ear, this is the panic membrane, and the quadrate and the articular. Dito yan sa that will be in the letter C. This is a primitive reptile. Seeing quadrant and articular connected with the columella, these tips. And that's the end of the mammal, which, which is showing the fate of the three bony fish, uh, three bones of the bony fish. Bird and fish, okay? The columella is derived from a bone we call as the hyomandibular bone, okay? The enclosed is derived from a quadrate bone, and the malleus is derived from the articular bone. So these are the three smallest bones in the in, in the mammal, mammalian skeleton, staves and the malleus. So that's amazing, right? Coming from amphibian reptiles, um, uh, primitive amphibian and primitive reptile. This is like uh, this has not been changed. They only fuse and only change in size. Okay? Vestigial structures also is important when this pelvic bone of baleen whales evolved from a functional pelvic bones of the whale's terrestrial mammalian ancestor. So coming from the mammalian ancestor, um, it retained in whales, okay, in the baleen whales. So they have no function in whales, but for us, they have a function, okay. So that is an example of a, of a vestigial structure when when it's not been used for some time. Like the, the tailbone of, of modern day humans. Here, these are vestigial structures. Um, developmental patterns of the embryonic stages of the various vertebrates are also, the sim also similar. So, resulting in the preservation of developmental sequences that evolved in early common ancestors of vertebrates. So, letter A, that's a fish, a bird, and a mammal. They have almost similar embryonic stages, right? For letter B, the organ systems like the nervous system, yeah, it's important because that it vertebra uh, animals have evolved to a more um, complex type of nervous system and it has led to the growing of head, we call that cephalization. 
like the other nervous system also showing the similar uh, similar development of patterns. So for a mammal and a chicken, um, you have forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain in the neural tube. They have almost the same structures. So how to interpret the evidence of phylogeny in the common descent? So scientists are using the data gathered from studies just to describe to understand how organisms are related to each other, how birds are related to dinosaurs, chickens, etc. And we call it phylogeny, refers to the evolutionary relationships among species. And it includes the division of ancestral species, you know, um, species that are found on on the lower form of the, the cladogram, we call it or phylogenetic trees, okay? Showing the branches of the set, may mga branch, okay? Yung sa taas, yung, uh, the upper part of the of the tree are the the modern animals or organisms, whereas the, the those found at the bottom are the ancestral ones. So the addition of molecular data is also important in revolutionizing phylogenetic studies. So now, uh, diba, in the first chapter, we, we, will, we will use DNA enzymes to study the molecular data of these animals. So, on. so for um, hemoglobin, okay, uh, the one, the protein which is found in your red blood cells, which makes your blood red, okay, and brings oxygen. Yeah. So uh, the next um, slide will show you a a hemoglobin phylogenetic tree, which is grouped in two alpha and beta families. The products of these genes are incorporated into the hemoglobin molecule that transports the oxygen in red blood cells, and also with um, other storage pigment muscles, which is myoglobin. So we have genes in the beta family have branch points or nodes. Kasi when you try to, try to check a tree, meron yung mga uh, nodes in the, in the trunk of the tree where another stem will grow, a branch will grow. So we call them nodes, okay? So they could represent individuals, species, or populations. Um, a branch represents an evolutionary connection with um, individuals, species, or population. And the longer the branch, okay, you can see it, the greater the variation and the more distant the evolutionary relationship between molecules, individuals, populations, or species. So the longer the tree, the longer the branch, the more farther they are from each other, or the more um, greater the variation. So if you see this, so this inverted shaft. Around 600 million years ago, you have this point here for 50. No near the branch here. So this is um, the phylogenetic tree of the hemoglobin. Alpha family and the beta family. So this is the myoglobin. So um, the studies are not limited to organisms but also for molecules. In this example, um, numbers associated with each branch point indicate the approximate times in millions of years. So this the longest time, 600 million years ago. And the latest are like 40 to 50 years ago. And the single gene in the alpha family is a gene that is apparently non-functional. So the linkage in this one is not the single gene, false gene, means to say it's not functional. So this is how we trace back the origin of the molecule hemoglobin. So in conclusion, we now know that evolution is the major unifying theme in biology. Um, coming from Darwin and in his expedition, um, both the similarities and the diversity of life has been discussed. And there is no doubt that this occurred in the past and continues to occur today, not because we're humans, we are <laughs> leveling up to another kind of superhuman known. We don't think that that, that way. Our next, le our next lesson will describe how Principles of population will um, explain how pop gen will work combined with the evolutionary theory of Charles Darwin. And we call that a modern synthesis. Yeah. So I think that's all 
for this lesson of evolutionary and uh, history and evidence. If you have more questions, don't forget to um, drop your questions in the chat box. Thank you so much.